Welcome all to the third week, what I'm calling the third week, actually the fourth week, but I'm calling it the third, as you should now know. Um, so this week we're moving past the history of the philosophy of time and into um, the contemporary philosophy of time. And it starts with um, McTaggart, so John uh, McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart, JME McTaggart, in 1908 and his publication of a famous paper, The Unreality of Time. And um, we're going to be concerned with looking at that, the argument that McTaggart gives in that paper in this series of videos. So the whole of this week is going to be focused on McTaggart's argument. It's such an important argument that we should focus a whole week on it. And as I've explained before, most of those who are now working in the contemporary philosophy of time, you can kind of define their view uh, with why they disagree with McTaggart. So not many people think that McTaggart was right. There are a few, but most people reject his argument, and um, yeah, and so you can understand what their positions are in terms of how they respond to McTaggart's argument. Right. Well, um, yeah. Before we start, a little bit of background, I suppose, about McTaggart himself. There he is. Apparently, a very shy man. Um, so he was at Cambridge University. Uh, he used to ride a tricycle around, three-wheeled bike. Um, knew Bertrand Russell very well. Bertrand Russell was heavily Im they, well. They they influenced each other, but Bertrand Russell, if you if you don't know, up until 1905, Bertrand Russell was a Hegelian. So Bertrand Russell believed or um, held the philosophical views, the broad philosophical views that Hegel held. That is uh, a form of um, a form of dual. Well, I suppose idealism of sorts that the fundamental nature of reality is mental. I think that that's a fair reading of Hegel, although Hegel is notoriously difficult to um, interpret. And um, yeah, Russell was a Hegelian because McTaggart was a Hegelian. Uh, so by the way, 1905 is when Russell published his famous paper on denoting and uh, changed his views and became a, a kind of pure analytic philosopher. Before that, Russell um, yeah, was, was a Hegelian and largely because of the influence of McTaggart. So McTaggart throughout his career was a Hegelian. Uh, in fact, he thought that the, the fundamental nature of the universe was uh, it was composed of loving spirits, which is a nice view to have, isn't it? I mean, I don't think it's true, but it'd be nice if it was. Yeah, so McTaggart agreed with Hegley, rejected the existence or the fundamental existence of the external world. Um, and that's kind of important to bear in mind as we're looking at his argument for the unreality of time. Because on his view, I mean, it's similar again to the Kantian view. Hegel is in the Kantian tradition. So the Kantian view is that uh, there's a noumenal realm um, which does include space and time and um, it, we can't have any access to its nature. Hegel agrees that the fundamental nature of the universe doesn't include space and time um, but he does think we can know something about its nature and McTaggart thinks we can as well. He thinks we can know that it is made up of loving spirits. Um, so that's the position the experience we have of space and time is not real. Um, there's no sense in which the universe in and of itself contains time or space and uh, yeah instead there's a kind of timeless universe made up of loving spirits. It's unclear. I'm not, we're not going to talk about that positive Hegelian view. We're going to largely ignore it but it's just so you know to situate McTaggart's argument in the background uh, or with that background against that view. Yeah, I think also I mentioned there's a, there's a, there's a small anecdote about uh, McTaggart about him um, adopting the middle name McTaggart. I got that wrong actually, I checked it out because I wasn't sure. So what actually happened was he was born John McTaggart Ellis and when his rich uncle died and left his money to him it was on the condition that he take on the name McTaggart as his surname. So he already had McTaggart as his middle name, and then he added, so John McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart, he became to get the uncle's money. I thought it was the other way around. I thought he already had McTaggart as his surname, and he had to add it as his middle name. But no, other way around. Anyway, so okay, um, what we're going to do then in these videos, we're going to. this is an introductory video. I'm going to start off by giving you the McTaggart's main argument, at least as I find it, in his 1908 paper, The Unreality of Time. We're not going to only be sticking to the argument that he gives in in that paper. He also wrote a book called The Nature of Existence, 
which was published in two volumes, great big long thing, and in there he reiterates the argument. He gives a slightly different version of the argument, but it's more or less the same. So we're going to be drawing on both sources. The primary source I'm taking it is the 1908 paper, but where there are slight differences, I'll pick up on that with the uh, uh, the later the later book. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is the argument I'm calling McTaggart one. I'm calling it that because we'll see. In, I'll, I'll put it up in a second. There's a second argument contained in the 1908 paper that um, is importantly different, but it's based upon. It's the same basic structure. Well, we'll see. So McTaggart one goes like this. So premise one, he argues that. So he's got sub arguments for each of these premises and we'll be looking at them. If time exists, then changes must occur. Okay. If changes occur, then positions in time or moments must form a particular series, the A series. And I'm going to be in this video trying to explain this distinction between the A series and the B series. That's my fundamental aim in this first video. So give you an introduction to these arguments and then explain so this premise relies upon the idea that moments can be organized in terms of this A series. So I'm going to try and explain what that means. So the A series is contradictory, then argues, a very famous part of the paper which is extremely hard to get your head around. But people claim to have got their head around it, we'll be having a look. So the A series is contradictory, and so moments cannot form such a series. Therefore time does not exist. Okay, so um, there's the first argument. We're going to have a little look at the structure of that shortly. I'm going to do it on the, the drawing board. Um, but okay, hopefully you can see that it's a valid argument. Um, that is, if the premises are true, the conclusion follows. So if we're going to reject the conclusion that time does not exist, then we're going to have to reject one of the premises, one or more of the premises. We'll come to that. But just so you know, have a look. So notice here, if time exists, then changes must... So, that the, the A series that the positions in time must form the A series and the A series is contradictory forms the backbone of this argument and notice that this is the second argument slightly different premise if time is to exist changes must occur in a particular direction so this is the idea um, that uh, not only does time flow but it flows in a particular direction it goes from past to future not future to past and McTaggart wants to say, well, in order for, for changes to occur in a particular direction, i.e. in order for, ch to, for time to flow in the way that it does, again, moments must form an A-series, but because the A-series is contradictory, um, so its moments cannot form such a series, and therefore time does not exist. So you can see it's got a similar, it's a similar idea. In particular, he wants to argue that in order for time to exist, in both cases, it must be, uh, that the moments can be form an A series, but the A series is contradictory, right? So, okay, those are the arguments. I'm going to bring these up on the sketchpad in a minute and try to illustrate their structure in a bit more detail. Um, but the fundamental thing I'm going to be concerned with in this first video is, so in later videos we're going to go on and look at these premises and see what we make of them, but I want to outline this idea of the A series and what it means. So, the A series, and I'm going to say a bit more about this, is to do with arranging moments in time in terms of past, present, and future. So if we say World War II was past, that is to, um, we say World War II was past, and World War I was even further past, for example, we might say. That's to arrange those two events, the World War I and World War II, in terms of the A series. We're saying one is past and one is more past. Or we might say something like uh, um, the coronavirus crisis is present, whereas the uh, the Spanish flu uh, epidemic is past, we might say. And that, again, is to organize those two events, those two occurrences, in terms of the A series. So whenever we attribute um, the property, we'll see it's a property of being past, the property of being present, the property of being future, to events um, or to moments in time directly, then that is to organize them in terms of the A series. So notice, by the way, that events are concrete occurrences 
they've got names, but they happen at, at times. We could just do all of this in terms of times if we want. We could say 1945 is past, 1900 is even further past, and we could talk directly of the moments of time. So we're thinking here of moments of time as being tied to events in a certain way. So, you know, World War II occurred between 1939 and 1945. So that event as it were, we can think about it as being sort of lodged in that past time. So yeah, events and times are kind of thought of as being tied together. And this is contrasted with the B series then, and the B series is when we organise moments of time rather than in terms of properties, so I say World War, notice I can say World War II is past, well when we organise things by the B series we can't just attribute a property directly to uh, the events themselves because look you can't say World War II was earlier than or World War II was simultaneous but it, it's a relation you've got to mention the two events when you talk about the B series so you can say World War II was earlier than uh, Donald Trump's election uh, we can say World War II was simultaneous with I don't know, something else that was happening in the world at that time. I can't think of any examples. Or we say World War II is later than World War I. You got the idea. So note that past, present and future, I'll say more about this when I illustrate it on the board, are properties, whereas earlier than, simultaneous with, and later than are relations. Okay, so I'm going to turn to the uh, board. And what I want to do then is let's take this argument. I should be able to use my snipping tool. And let's see if I can copy this across. Okay, so let's take this argument, copy, and I think I should be able to paste it into here. Let's see if this works. Yes. Okay, so let's have a look at this argument and look at its structure first of all. Uh, then I'll turn back to, um, so all I've done so far, laid out these two arguments, the, the main argument in the paper the uh, McTaggart 1, and this is McTaggart 1. I've had a look, I've laid out the second argument, McTaggart 2, and then we've um, uh, we just briefly considered the distinction between the A series and the B series, which features prominently in both of the arguments. And I'm going to go on and uh, say a bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so let's start with this. Okay, let's see if my pen works. Okay, yep, there we go. So all right, what I want to do here is to first of all highlight um, the structure of this argument. Notice then we've got if time exists, then changes must occur. So let's uh, let's record time exists that particular proposition here as p. Okay, so that's the proposition. We're just using the the letter p. You'll see why it's important that we do this, because it, it gives us a clear uh, view of the structure of this argument. So we're going to label the proposition that time exists with the letter P. And then we're going to have the idea that changes must occur. Changes must occur. We're going to label that with Q. So just to be absolutely clear, we're not assessing these premises at the moment. We're not asking whether they're true. All we're doing is trying to lay down the structure of the argument. Okay, so then in the uh, second premise, we've got a repeat of Q. So if changes occur, or I mean, I know there's this word must here. In fact, we can actually delete that if we want. So he puts it in terms of uh, must occur, but if they must occur, then they do occur. So we can just have it if time exists then changes occur right that's a straightforward in other words don't worry about the must it doesn't make any difference to the argument so we get a repeat if changes occur then positions in time so this is our second proposition positions in time or well, third proposition overall second in this premise must form a particular series the a series okay so let's record that as uh positions in time form the A series positions in time form the A series should be a capital okay 
So that is going to equal R. Right. So then what have we got in the final two premises here? Or the, the, the third, sorry. What have we got in the third premise and the conclusion? Well, we got the A series is contradictory. And so moments in time cannot form such a series. So we can think about that premise there as being it's not the case because if the, if the A series can't form such a series then they don't form such a series so we've got as it were here not R right we've just got the negation here so we've got not R it's not the case that positions in time for the A series so this symbol here just means not um, putting all that together then what have we got well premise 1 says if P if time exists then Q changes must occur. Premise two then says, well, if Q, then positions in time must form the A series, R. And premise three says it's not the case that R, so our conclusion is not P. So if we look at the structure of the argument, it's like an extended modus tollens. So if you remember, modus tollens runs like this, therefore not P. Oops, sorry therefore not P. So that's a modus ponens form of argument. If P then Q, not Q, so not P. Well here we've almost got the same structure except that, because notice what we've got here are two conditionals joined together if you like. If P then Q, if Q then R, not R. Well if not R then not Q and if not Q then not P, so not P. So it's a valid argument. I hope that you can see that. Um, one other way of thinking about it is if we've got if P then Q and if Q then R, well we can put those two together and if you know these two here give us if P then R, then we've got not R, so not P. We've got a straightforward uh, modus tollens in that case. Okay, so that's the structure of the first argument. And we'll see that the structure of the second argument is similar, so let's... Uh, uh, I can think I can delete that now, can I? If P then Q, if Q then R, not R, so not P. Just keep that in mind, that structure, as we go. I'll remind you about it anyway. But let's now clear this canvas and have a look at the second argument and its structure. So again, snipping tool. New. Okay. We'll see anyway that this is very, very similar. Shove that in. Oops. Come down here. Okay, so um, in this case, then I'll just do this quicker than I did before. I won't. I won't bother. So we've got if time exists, p changes must occur in a particular direction, q. Well, if changes occur in a particular direction, so if q. Then moments must form the A series, R, but not R, so not P. So it's the same structure. Oops. It's exactly the same structure. If P then Q, if Q then R, not R, so not P. And the point is, because this is a valid argument, it, that just means that, you know, if those premises are true, then the conclusion follows. So if you want to say that time exists, then you've got to say something to McTaggart about which one of these premises is false. Maybe more than one is false, but at any rate, uh, he places the onus upon the person who disagrees with him to say where, he, where they think the argument goes wrong. Okay? So we're going to be looking at these premises in the videos that follow. But in this one, as I said, what I now want to do, now we're clear about the structure of the argument, uh, because the idea of the A series plays such a fundamental role in it, I first of all just want to get clear about the notion of the A series. So it's clear canvas and talk about that. Um, so okay, we've said that there are two ways then, so as I put it, the A series is to do with arranging things in terms of past, present and future. And the B series, so put a break. The B series is to do with uh, before or earlier than. Maybe I'll do it in terms of earlier than. But before is a synonym. So you know we can either say World War 
one is before World War Two, or we can say World War One is earlier than World War Two. I'll just put earlier than and later than. There's also simultaneous with as well, but we won't bother. All right. So, um, and as I wanted to emphasise, these are properties. Earlier than is a relation. What do I mean by that? Well, we can just say x is past. So here we just attribute something to a single thing. You know, the same as we might say Smith is tall. Here, being tall is a property of Smith. Okay. Similarly, if we have World War Two, oops, <laughs> World War Three, World. Hopefully, it's not future. World War Two is past. It's to attribute the property of being past to World War Two. Okay. So their properties. But if we contrast that with earlier than and later than, you know, we can't say World War Two is earlier than and leave it at that. This is not, in other words, a property of World War Two. World War Two doesn't have the property of being earlier than. Doesn't make sense. We're missing another term on the other side. We need uh, to have something like World War Two is earlier than. Um, I don't know what should we have. Well, um, let's have the. Uh, <laughs> I hate trying to think of arbitrary events. World War Two is earlier than uh, the Queen, the, the the Queen's Jubilee. Jubilee. To pick an arbitrary event. Okay. Um, yes, so in other words, right, earlier than relates to events. Past, present, and future are all properties. I hope, it, hope it's clear. So, you know, the same as, uh, let's just have Smith is to the left of Jones. Okay, so being to the left of is a relation between two things. You can't just say Smith is to the left of. And leave it at that. You've got to have Smith and Jones, and this is a relation. Similarly, earlier than is a relation. Okay, so past, present, and future properties of events, and um, earlier than, later than relations between events. Okay, so given that we've got these properties and then these relations, um, Yes. Why? How do they differ? So yeah, that's the important thing that they they differ in a certain respect from one another. So let's just take an example. Then let's have well, let's take our example of World War Two is past. We say, but it looks as though this is not a timeless fact. World War Two is past is true now, but the truth value of this sentence has changed. This sentence used to be, I mean, think about. The timeline, let's put a timeline up in fact. And let's suppose that all of time is laid out on this timeline. Uh, so let's put in, I don't know, let's put, uh, let's put World War 1945, so it goes past. So here we've got, let's draw a, oh I don't know, let's have a, a tank. So World War Two, 1940. I know it was ended in 1945. Anyway, it'll do. Uh, and let's have the present moment, 2020. And I don't know. <laughs> There's a person stood in 2020. So okay, um, where we are. This is where we are. This is the moment we think is the present moment. And we say from here, World War Two is past. Okay, and we think that that's true. But if we go back to 1917, and all right, they might not know it's going to happen, but World War II, you know, if they did, they would be able to say, is future. Okay. And in fact, somebody inside this tank here will be able to say, World War II is present. So the idea here is meant to be simply that when we say that World War Two has the property of being past here in nineteen in, in twenty twenty, well, um, yes, it's true that it's past, but it's only true from our perspective. 
From 1917, it wasn't true that World War II is past, then World War II is future, then in 1945 it's present. So the idea is that when we organize things by the A-series, they do have these properties, but they change over time. So each event starts off with having the property of being future, then it becomes present, and then it turns into past, we might say. So we get this shift. Um, it's not always the case that World War II has um, any one of these properties, it looks like it has all three of these properties at different times, right? So, in 1917 it was future, in 1945 it was present, and then in 2020 it's past. So that's key. The key here then is A properties, it seems, change. They involve some sort of a shift. So, okay. Now let's think about, oh, I'm getting rid of all these don't want to get rid of the people. Use the rubber then. So now let's have a think about um, the second, the B series relations. So the key thing to take from that is A series relations change over time. But now if you look at the B series, well, what can I say about this? Well, let's have this as, uh, so this is World War Two here. Let's have this as World War, I keep doing World War Three. Why do that? Any anyway, World War Two? Oh, okay. Now that's World War One. That line. Is that line? No, that's just a division on the timeline. Anyway, anyway, you get it. So okay, here I can say World War Two is later than World War One. So I can say that here. And again, right? Okay, you know, there's problems. I don't know it's going to happen, but. Okay, if they did, World War Two is later than World War One, and here they can say the same thing. World War Two is later than World War One. In other words, they can say the same thing here. World War Two is later than World War One, and whenever we arrange things according to the B series, says McTaggart they are timeless facts. It's not like World War II can ever become earlier than World War I. It always has been earlier than, always will be earlier. Uh, sorry, World War II always has been later than World War I and always will be later than World War uh, One. So I hope that, that makes sense. I mean, there's the distinction. When we organize things in terms of the A-series, we get these changing properties that events have moving from past then present then future and when we organize things by the B series uh, what we've got are relations which remain fixed forever so they don't change so okay that's the key um, idea let's return quite briefly to McTaggart's argument and just have a look at it in the light of that again the main argument argument one. Well okay, the idea is then is going to be if we try to arrange things in terms of this A series, in terms of giving things past, present and future, he's going to argue that that's contradictory, that, that there's something wrong with doing that and therefore we, it's impossible, we can't say that moments are arranged in terms of past, present and future. Okay, so, all right, but he's also going to say up in the premise uh, one and two, the idea that you know, in order for time to exist, we must have changes. And we can see, we can begin to see what his idea here is. That the, the broad idea is, in order to have a proper flow to time, this movement, this change, which seems to involve uh, the flow of time, things moving from past, present, and future. In other words, right, this changing notion, of the, as opposed to the B series notion, where nothing changes. Uh, on his view. So to get change in the flow to time we must organize things in terms of past, present and future like the A-series says with these changing properties. But he's going to argue that's contradictory so we can't and if then we can't organize things so that these changes occur then time doesn't exist. That's going to be the argument. So okay, um, hopefully that's clear enough and uh, in the second video then we're going to start to look at the premises and we're going to start with, um, yeah, maybe, I'm not sure how many videos I'll do this week. I'll try and split these up into digestible chunks. 
So maybe in the next video I'll just do premise one. It might be relatively short, but anyway. So next we're going to turn and have a look at the first premise here and have uh, have a think about this idea that if time exists, then changes must occur. How does he defend that premise, and what does he mean by it? Okay, then I'll do that now.